Welcome, we're gonna give you an introduction today to our red wines here at Chateau Chantal. I'm Marie, we've got winemaker Mark and tasting room manager Bill here to discuss the wines that begin here in the middle of our tasting sheet, starting out with our Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noir is a dry, light-bodied red wine showing red berry, cherry, and a hint of spice from about three months of oak aging. This is a really terrific bargain, this Pinot Noir. Uh, the wine is a great food wine, and we like to pair it with mushroom dishes, salmon, lamb, and soft dry and cheeses. As Maria mentioned, it's, it's light in color, uh, which is something that Pinot Noir has fought its whole life. Uh, somehow or another in this country, uh, I think because of most of the red wines coming from California, from a much hotter climate, we've kind of come to associate with intensity of color with quality of the wine. And Pinot Noir will never have the color of a, a Shiraz or a, a Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a lighter skinned grape and, and will always have a lighter color. I've often said that if you get a very, very inky dark Pinot Noir, uh, the ma marketing people got involved with the winemaking process and added something to, uh, to darken the color because that wouldn't be natural for a Pinot Noir. They're always going to be lighter in color. And whereas a Cabernet Sauvignon can, uh, can knock your socks off, a good Pinot Noir should always ease your foot into a silk slipper. Uh, the numbers on this, the residual sugar, uh, with one exception, one notable exception here in this whole lineup, they're all dry. Uh, the residual <coughs> sugar here is uh, less than uh, two grams per liter. The acid in all red wines is also much lower. It's just a, a function of the grape varieties themselves. The acid here is 7.02. And the alcohol is usually a little bit higher because they are fermented to total dryness. So the alcohol on this Pinot Noir is 13%. And as I'm in the habit of saying about uh, pretty much all our reds uh, that, that made from grapes grown here, it, it, generally speaking, they're just lighter by nature per the cooler, shorter growing season in which we grow them. Uh, I'm inclined to point out that the reds that we make are, are just going to be softer than what tends to dominate the average uh, uh, wine selection where most of us shop. And, and as long as we can point that out, that uh, you know we can't make the reds that, that are unto themselves a meal, but rather we make the reds that are very complementary of the meal, uh, I think we'll be all right. Next in the line is our Reserve Pinot Noir. And this, of course, is a dry red uh, with a rich, darker fruit bouquet of plums, cherries, strawberries, and again, spice from 10 months in French barrel on this wine, uh, bringing a lot of layers of complexity to it. It's a more earthy expression of the grape. Pair this wine with mushroom top filet and great with uh, chicken cooked in red wine. Uh, with no other grape variety uh, do clones make as much uh, difference as with Pinot Noir. And we grow several different clones. For the, the uh, regular Pinot Noir, it's mostly the Gamay Beaujolais clone, uh, also some Pomard, and then um, a, a smattering of other clones. With the reserve, it's always what we now refer to as the Boeing clones because they have numbers uh, like 667, 777. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's from these clones in a particular, in two particular vineyards actually, uh, that we use the grapes to make the reserve Pinot Noir. Much lower yielding, more concentrated grapes. The, uh, the numbers here, again, residual sugar is virtually zero, less than two grams per liter. Uh, the acid, 6.6 .6 grams, so very soft. Uh, but because of that concentration in the grapes themselves, uh, not only of flavors, but also of sugars, we're looking at an alcohol content here of 14.4%. And I, I can't help but feel that uh, Pinot Noir is uh, about as versatile as wine gets, uh, particularly if it's red you're reaching for. Uh, being paired with red meat, white meat, fish, uh, catering well to both uh, the, you know, the dry wine drinkers as well as the sweet wine drinkers because of its uh, generally softer finish. Uh, Pinot Noir, uh, 
a, a desert island wine if ever there were one. Moving next to our more medium and fuller bodied reds. The first off is our Reserve Trio. This of course is a dry red blend of Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and just a very small smidge of Pinot Noir. This is basically the Michigan version of a Bordeaux blend that you would find in France where they combine typically Cabernet Sauvignon with Merlot. In this case, we're using Cabernet Franc and Merlot. It's a fuller bodied red showing plum and mocha with some oak notes of vanilla. We like to serve this with a pepper steak, game dishes, or firmer ripe cheeses. This is one of the more fun wines to, to make as the winemaker because we have about 100 barrels of these varieties in our sub cellar, in the, in the sub uh, barrel cellar. And uh, it's our job to go through and select just the absolute best barrels to go into this particular blend. Um, and when we're looking at the Cabernet Franc, well, we're only tasting Cabernet Franc. With the trio, we get to taste all of the barrels mm -hmm. to come up with the best. So it makes for long days <laughs> and even longer nights. Um, the numbers on this, again, less than two grams uh, per liter of residual sugar. Acid is 6.3. And the alcohol here was tamed down uh, somewhat. Uh, it's only 12%, but still up there. So uh, Merlot is a very well-known grape, and uh, often someone will ask, hey, you know, what about some Merlot? And uh, so be quick to point toward the trio, which is where pretty much most of our Merlot, as far as I know, goes in any given year. <clears throat> Only rarely have we bottled the Merlot on its own, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, but I, I refer to trio as being a lesson in relativity, uh, you know, relative uh, to red wine of the world, as I was just going on about the others, uh, uh, all of them in general, um, you know, lighter by nature. But relative to this neighborhood, this is about, this is about as gutsy as red gets. Next up is our reserve Cabernet Franc. And this is a dry, more medium-bodied red with plum, violet, and herbal characters. It's sourced 100% from our CEO's vineyard, Jim Krupka, hence labeled the Krupka Vineyard, meaning 100% of the fruit comes from that specific vineyard. We age it for 12 months in a combination of American and French oak. We like to pair it with roast beef, herb rub steaks, and great with pastas with red sauces. Uh, the Krupka Vineyard is one of our steepest vineyards uh, with a south-facing slope um, we can only farm that uh, when it's relatively dry. If we've had any uh, dew or any rain, uh, the grass becomes so slick that our vineyard manager won't drive a tractor in there because it is so steep uh, and we're afraid of slipping there. It's, uh, it's a perfect exposure and the grapes uh, benefit greatly from that exposure to the sun. Um, sugar here, again, virtually zero. Uh, acid, 6.3% and alcohol, again, um, at 12 percent. And I point, <clears throat> excuse me, I point to the Cabernet Franc grape as, well, leading the red wine charge uh, in this neighborhood. And by that I mean, uh, for, for the winemakers I'm familiar with, it seems that most of them are hanging their hats on this varietal to best whittle away the stigma that we're only good for whites, uh, while simultaneously uh, enabling us to compete on a world stage with red. And next, we're going to move into our Reserve Malbec. So this has a pretty interesting story. It's not a wine that we grow here in Michigan, uh, but we'll let Mark speak more about that. Uh, Reserve Malbec is a dry, full-bodied red sourced from our Argentine vineyard. It shows dark, rich berry flavors with a little vanilla from oak aging. We like to serve it with grilled meats and vegetables. It's great with our Malbec barbecue sauce and burgers and pasta. In 2004, we bought a 135-acre piece of property with 55 acres of Malbec planted in Argentina, just a little southeast of the city of Mendoza, Argentina. It's a high desert plateau, uh, about 3,400 feet above sea level, uh, that is virtually a desert with just cactus and sagebrush growing where there is no irrigation. Where there is irrigation, and it's 3% of the state of Mendoza, 
uh, it's a Garden of Eden. Um, it's incredible what's grown there, and it is a climate where we can grow the biggest and the baddest red wines, I think, in the world. Uh, the the uh, signature grape of the region is the Malbec, which is one of the six uh, varieties that is permitted to be grown in Bordeaux. Uh, they have since stopped growing Malbec in Bordeaux. They felt that it was too vigorous for them there. But in the desert region in Mendoza, it has found its true home uh, and is really a delight to grow there. Um, always always very, very ripe. Um, rarely will we have an alcohol content below 14%, and this one doesn't disappoint. This is at 14.1%. Uh, also always very low in acid because most of the acid in the grapes is respirated into those sugars. So the acid here is at five grams per liter, and, and it has also less than two grams of residual sugar per liter. This Malbec thoroughly distinguishes us from the neighbors in that uh, of 103 Michigan wineries, last I counted, we remain the only Michigan winery to own a vineyard outside the country. And uh, we are fond of boasting in the wine shop of the fact that in addition to owning the vines that grew these grapes, the, our vintner is the one who, who oversees the operations of, of the winemaking, uh, the vineyard uh, as well. Uh, not, not entirely, mind you, but... Uh, he gets down there, it seems often enough. <laughs> uh, good for him. Uh, so, uh, in, in the story goes, and, and all too easily people can get confused about this, so you might have to repeat it. Uh, the wine is made there, uh, packed up in bulk as wine, and, and is uh, transported by land and sea back to us here, and it is here where we barrel and, and, and bottle it. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it's easy for someone to think it's just someone else's wine with our name on it. And, and we'd rather emphasize uh, the truth uh, being otherwise. That this really is an estate wine. We didn't buy bulk wine off the bulk wine market. Uh, <clears throat> we own the vineyard, we grow the grapes, and I am down there every year, the month of March, it's opposite seasons, uh, for the winemaking back again in June, for racking the wine, uh, pressing the grapes off of the skins, barreling the wines, and then usually back again sometime in our fall here, for arranging which wines we want shipped up here uh, to go into our program. The rest of the wine that doesn't make the cut for us is sold on the bulk market in Argentina. Next in line for our red wines are the Naughty and Nice Red Wine Series. These are two wines of virtually the same blend, again a proprietary blend of red wine grapes here, that are made in two different styles. The Naughty is the drier, the nice has a little bit of sweetness to it. Both wines are kind of a medium bodied red and they display some light red berry fruits. Both of them are terrific with grilled foods, great for barbecues, and the nice red in particular during summer is beneficial because we actually serve it slightly chilled. So on a warm summer day, if you're in the mood for some red, nice is where you'd like to go with that. Um. As Marie said, they are uh, they're proprietary blends. The objective here is to make red wines that don't have the, the intense body and the tannins uh, of, that we tend to associate with big red wines. We want a wine, uh, in both cases, that is soft enough and gentle enough that in pinch you could even have that uh, with fish, which is the definition of naughty in the wine business, red wine with fish. Try it. Um, both wines uh, come in at about 12% alcohol. Uh, the residual sugar on the naughty is about a half a percent, five grams per liter. On the nice, three percent, 30 grams <clears throat> per, per liter. And the acid is six and a half grams per liter on both of them. Uh, quintessential table wines, as I define that as. Uh uh, made for everyday use, so very versatile, you know, not intended to be stored for a long time, uh, and, and, and just so well suited to be adventurous with. And, and you know, different mood, different meal, per the, the difference in the residual sugar, uh, but both qualify as great stepping stones into red wines. Uh, turning around those many folks who come to us uh, a 
feeling or, or, or even you know proclaiming no red wine for me. Uh, naughty red will give people a great stepping stone into dry reds, while nice red will just have a, people rethink red because it seems that most people still don't conceive of a red wine being sweet enough to chill, as is the case with nice red. Uh, again, uh, don't judge a book by the cover.